So good morning from Vienna and thank you for joining us for today's panel discussion, pushbacks, vetoes, boycotts, what will the Schengen dispute mean for Central and Eastern Europe? We have decided to organize this event at rather short notice. Uh, after last Thursday, Austria vetoed the Schengen accession of Romania and Bulgaria. Both countries uh, um, became EU members in 2007 and ever since have been waiting to join the Schengen area, which is the world's largest free movement zone. Um, as the accession requires unanimous approval, the veto of Austria and in case of Bulgaria, also the veto of the Netherlands has been able to block this process. And all of that despite an open support and recommendation of the European Commission. The green light was given only to Croatia and EU members since 12, uh, 2013. The Austrian government justifies, uh, justifies its decision with uh, fears of uncontrolled irregular migration. And in response to that, the Romanian ambassador in Austria was called back to Bucharest for consultations. And in both Romania and Bulgaria, there are calls for boycotts of Austrian products and investors. Those developments are a starting point for our today's discussion, which I have the pleasure to moderate. My name is Martina Talig, and I'm a research associate at the Institute for the Danube Region and Central Europe in Vienna. And with me are four excellent experts. Uh, Mihai Razvan Unguriano, former Prime Minister of Romania. Uh, online jo is joining us Vladislava Gubalova, Senior Research Fellow at Globsec. Um, for us is also Daniela Pajdin, research associate at the IDM. And last, but definitely not least, Sebastian Schaeffer, managing director of the IDM. So we're welcome to all of you. Thank you. Thank you. And a brief remark to our audience. Uh, this discussion is being also streamed on the YouTube channel of the IDM. And if you want to ask questions or add comments, please feel free to post them um, in the chat window either on Zoom or on YouTube. So let us start. Um, at the very beginning, um, let's try to understand what has actually happened. Why did it even came to this veto in the first place? Um, so I will ask the first question, uh, to, uh, I'll ask you, Daniel, the first question, which is why did Vienna go that far and block Romanians and Bulgaria's accession? How can we understand that? What's the explanation? Is it only about migration or is there something more to it? Thank you, Adina. Yeah, that, that's the question that has uh, occupied us for a few days now. And I think it hasn't been sufficiently answered yet. So of course, the official reason is um, migration. It was, as the uh, foreign minister of Austria said, uh, a call for help. But um, there are different wordings, let's say, and uh, the main reason behind is uh, agenda setting, I would say. Uh, Austria wanted with this veto um, to bring the, the case, of course, the Austrian case, the Austrian national interest in this regard and its uh, uh, yeah, fears and um, definitely a, a clear increase of irregular border crossings that has happened uh, in the recent months. They wanted to bring this to the agenda, to the EU agenda, and that was, I would say, the ahead of the of the EU summit, a good occasion to get awareness uh, for this topic. But this has, of course, a bit of a history. It also has a side history. Um, there was there were claims that the the local um, elections coming up in Low Austria might uh, have an effect on this. Uh, I'm not a, a big supporter of this theory because. In the end, of course, it will help the, the um, conservative party uh, to bring uh, migration uh, to the table in the, in the domestic politics. But I don't think that um, it would really um, I don't know, that would really be the main platform to do that. This you could also do in a, in a domestic uh, platform, let's say. So it was definitely a way to as well um, in the background of already having had talks with, with Hungary, with Serbia regarding uh, migration. Uh, of forming a kind of an alliance on an EU, on an EU level and to really push forward uh, a stronger um, policy towards migration and attention. Do you think it's just because the opportunity presented itself to raise an awareness about this issue and about migration? Or so could it be any other occasion? 
when Austria would. It gives, of course, uh, always gives you a leverage if you if you meet or something. So of course, it is an occasion, I would say. Um, it came, nevertheless, very surprising, also for uh, diplomats, I would say. So I'm not sure in how far it was internally even discussed before to to lead to this case. We we uh, saw that uh, just uh, days ago um, or a few weeks ago, they already uh, agreed on on uh, the accession of of Romania and Bulgaria within small circles. So there was definitely a very short notice change of opinion. And uh, everyone is wondering now how this came, if this was a spontaneous idea or if it was just an opportunity, let's say, that mm -hmm. was open up. Yeah, thank you. So let me now turn to, to Vladi and to Mihai and hear a little bit about the perspectives of the affected countries. As Danina already mentioned, it was probably not expected how do you see it? Was it expected in Bulgaria and Romania? Um, how it was perceived in both countries? And what do you think are the consequences of this veto? Maybe let's start alphabetically with Bulgaria. So, Vladi, please go ahead. Thank you very much. And thank you very much for inviting me um, to discuss this quite important topic indeed. Um, as you already mentioned, uh, Bulgaria, it's in a slightly different situation than Romania um, because we were vetoed by both Austria and the Netherlands. Um, and this is clearly not the first time that the country has been stopped from entering um, into the Schengen area. We have been waiting for 11 years now. Uh, but this time around, uh, definitely the emotions, but also the interest of the public, it's much higher. Um, the, the interest and the emotions from the political elite with the public itself, which is something different than previous times uh, when Bulgaria has been vetoed by different member states in the past. Um, perhaps partly as uh, why this is the case, uh, the war in Ukraine really brought this uh, expectation of unity, expectation of internal support or solidarity as, as uh, a word that has been used a lot among the EU member states. Um, I think partly it's different because um, Bulgaria realizes that it was surpassed and it's almost the last left standing looking from the outside. Um, and maybe partly because uh, at, at least in this matter, Bulgaria actually has done its work. And for the first time has been shown such a strong, strong support from the European institutions, both the commission and and the uh, and the parliament. Uh, there has been, of course, before, but uh, this time around, it just felt right. Um, now, uh, for from the Bulgarian point of view, um, it was clear more so that uh, it will be less uh, successful because the Netherlands were quite strongly um, ahead of the vote, uh, providing the statements that uh, they will veto um, they will veto the Bulgarians' bid. Um, but uh, in some sense, uh, something interesting happened in Bulgaria because we have been in about two years of political crisis and um, this uh, somewhat united the political elite, although admittedly it was a bit late in the last days. Uh, we are with a caretaker government just to remind everyone. So this is a bit different situation. Um, there was some blaming, of course, internally, but at the end of the day, there was the realization that a, a, a final push is, is uh, very needed. And for the very first time, we had a yes demonstration, a yes public demonstration, a positive yes EU dem demonstration in Bulgaria, rather than no to this or no to that, that we have been seeing um, in the past two years. Um, so, so this is, to me, important to note um, the difference this time around. Um, and uh, some of the immediate consequences before even the vote. But after the vote, what, what were the, the, the immediate um, consequences, let's say, is uh, there were two different positions that were taken by the government towards Austria and towards uh, the Netherlands. Um, and, and I think this is also very important to note. And again, this separates a little bit um, Bulgaria from Romania because we had this extra extra veto com coming our way. Um, and uh, we definitely saw a much bitter, less diplomatic reaction towards the Netherlands. Um, there was a perception that this veto is driven by also um, assumingly domestic political matters. Um, there is no real and tangible argument. Um, there was actively refusing being part of a fact-finding mission um, in Bulgaria earlier this year. 
and artificially somewhat attaching the rule of law corruption to the decision, just as we see here with, um, with Austria and the migration. Um, so from the, from the Bulgarian side of what I'm gathering, it looks that even if we don't know how to satisfy the demands from the Dutch government, because we don't see them as any tangible conditions being set um, towards us, what we actually need to do in milestones, right? In something tangible, we need, you need, you need to decrease, I don't know, uh, corruption rate by 3% in the judiciary system. Uh, something, simply there is no tangibility. The problem also is in addition that the Dutch prime minister made a very unfortunate remark uh, on how for 50 euros, you can cross the Bulgarian border easily. And this happened very soon after three Bulgarian policemen actually were killed at the border. So that brought the further public attention uh, on the situation and, 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 and um, it, really, it really brought this bitterness out. Um, and maybe just to finish with the immediate reactions, after the veto of the Austrian government, actually the Bulgarian government is quite more understanding of the decision of the Austrian government. It may not be argument, I'm sorry, of the argument of, of, the, of the Austrian uh, government. Um, and what I am again gathering uh, from, from, uh, from uh, comments that are being made is that it seems that they're in much more intense talks already uh, with the Austrian counterpart, proposing actually already some tangible solutions to, as they see it, tangible conditions that have been set, uh, set towards them. So this is a little bit different on the reaction. And maybe just to, to, to touch upon what Daniela mentioned that, yes, it may be that uh, Austria is uh, uh, pushing for, a, for an agenda or refocusing on something that it, it's very important to them on migration. But this is also important for Bulgaria, and they have been also talking about migration in the past. So maybe in that sense, you're right. It's it's a leverage, it's alliance, it's something of a mix um, that somehow it makes a little bit of sense to Bulgaria in a very short term, I would say. Um, like just to clarify, those intense talks with Austria started after the veto or already before? I think that they were already probably done before uh, of what, what I read of some of the positions from the, from the interior minister, particularly that very quickly um, some specific suggestions were proposed to the Austrian government of how we can do either join missions at the border or some kind of other specific, uh, specific uh, joint initiatives that can be done to show our preparedness to, to join Schengen. Okay. And what does the situation look like in Romania? Are there any parallel reactions? Well, thank you very much, uh, Vladislava, for um, uh, your description. I think, uh, yeah, there a parallel para para would be drawn. On the other hand, uh, there are different situations. Romania is different in this, from this point of view of the case of Bulgaria. Uh, uh, let me come back to Vladislava's uh, uh, words. Uh, it took Bucharest by utter surprise. I mean, it was a watershed. And I, I don't shy away from, uh, from using this, uh, this now. Why? On the other hand, uh, imagine that during the Salzburg Forum meeting, that was in November. So a question of days prior to the, uh, to the vote in the, um, uh, in, the, uh, in, in the commission, um, Internal Affairs and Justice Commission, um, Austria was positive. So what was Romania worried about would have been at that time, the vote in the uh, Swedish parliament, and the potential opposition of the Netherlands. Romania volunteered to host two um, uh, 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 commissions of experts uh, on a voluntary basis who could come from all over the European Union to check again whether Romania fulfills all the technical uh, requirements uh, for joining the, uh, the Schengen space. And there were two commissions, one in October and one in November. The last one, the conclusions of the last one were positive and they were so positive that changed the vote in the Swedish parliament and turned Netherlands around. 
So in the end, uh, days prior to the, the to the veto to the, uh, uh, scene, Romania could not foresee any problem in getting the unanimous vote. Moreover, and this was a question related to joining, joining the Schengen space years ago, the famous cooperation and verification mechanism was lifted for Romania in November. Years ago, when the Schengen issue came on the table, there were always voices linking, politically linking for different for reasons, politically linking the, the so-called um, uh, this mechanism uh, and the fulfillment of its requirements to joining the Schengen. This time, all conditions were met, let me put it this way. So the surprise was so big that it stirred up not just emotions, but uh, quite serious institutional consequences. And one of them has been uh, uh, alluded to by Vladislava. Um, the Romanian ambassador in Vienna was called, and, and by Maldina, uh, it was called back home for consultations, which in the diplomatic uh, dance, so to say, it's like stepping on somebody's toes. It's not a mistake, in my opinion. I think it was the, the right thing to do, showing that um, the relations at this point, the diplomatic relations between Romania and Austria are represented on the side of Romania uh, only by the so-called charge d'affaires, making the relations, um, as in German, ice cut. The same happened with the uh, Austrian ambassador in Bucharest, which was summoned to the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and was not received by the minister as usual, but by the Secretary of State, signaling that the disappointment is uh, has gone beyond, let's say, uh, 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 the, the, the line, the limit of accepting it properly. And then there was uh, the declaration of the uh, Mr. Johannes, the president of Romania, which was pretty tough. And then came a letter from the um, uh, Romanian minister of, uh, of interior uh, addressed to uh, his uh, Austrian counterpart, which was, I would say, not just tough, it was a slap in the face. All in all, added, you know, adding, um, uh, Green told this uh, situation. The Austrian president, Mr. Van, Professor van der Bellen, came out with a critical statement to what the government did. And we can see now that the Schengen issue succeeded to split opinions within the most important parties. In the Social Democrats, Mr. Doskozil yesterday started to discuss about migration and stuff making, uh, 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 transforming uh, the chairman of the Social Democratic Party into uh, uh, an angry person. Whereas in the, in the ÖVP, in the Conservative Party, Mr. Podmar Karas was vice, chair, vice chairman of the European Parliament, uh, criticized uh, the, 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 uh, the direction supported by Mr. Um, by the, by the Chancellor, by Mr. Lehaf. What has been left for us was, or better to say what stays with us, is the feeling that the decision, again, 48 hours prior to the vote, was very much up to the immediate understanding of Mr. Nehammer and the Minister of Interior. And my feeling is that the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, the Federal Minister of Foreign Affairs in Vienna was taken by surprise. Mr. Schallenberg came out late with something that was pretty vague. And this is very much because no one could explain properly in Vienna what was the reasons this veto came for. It, yeah, one may consider that there should be, that ought be a, a, a domestic political reasoning as um, uh, Daniela said, I'm not very much into this theory either. Although the ÖVP uh, in the event of an election uh, uh, came down from 37.5% uh, of electoral acceptance to roughly 20. But 
the migration, the subject called migration was not on the table. Another reason why we were also taken by surprise was that Austria is now claiming that wants to determine the European Commission to build a, a common European policy on migration and asylum. But it was Austria who always said no to a common European policy for asylum till October this year. And this is paradoxical. It's 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 you know it's like turning the car in the midst of uh, you know in the midst of a, a, a of a crossroads. It's uh, it, it is till this very moment quite unexplainable. The result back in Romania, um, that well, the general public in Romania reacted quite tough to this. It was as Vladislava said, very emotionally charged. The decision was taken was taken as uh, uh, a sign of uh, um, uh, enmity towards Romania itself, and because it's emotional charge, the reaction in the public was very um, uh, was incredibly large, from calls to boycotting, and some things happened in in these moments in Romania to the reaction of the Romanian uh, institutions, the Romanian Europarliamentarians who were united in one single voice in criticizing Austria. And uh, having, you know, I guess the background of a general approval or support coming from the European Commission, European Parliament, and so on and so forth. And a large minus one majority of the uh, uh, European Council. Why is the situation delicate for Austria at this moment, leaving Mr. Nehammer's, um, I'd say, not exactly well uh, uh, construed political declarations referring to the 50 euros uh, and stuff like this, or proofs of cynicism, in my opinion. Um, the problem for Austria comes from the fact that, on one hand, it has always enjoyed a positive, a very positive image in Romania, not just because of Austria is a common destination for Romanian citizens' holidays. But it, it is something that links us. It's about history, it's about culture, it's about what means Vienna to Romanians and stuff. There is something else as well. It's the second largest foreign investor in Romania with a value um, of, of, of my, worth more than 10 billion euros. Meaning that from banking to um, uh, oil and gas exploitation, Austria is very important. And therefore it has its own very weak sides on this in relation with Bucharest. Second, every two, um, uh, one of every two flag person in, in Austria is a Romanian, which makes something like 26, 26,000 Romanian ladies and gentlemen working here, and again, in a very sensitive uh, uh, part of the Austrian society. And this is, uh, uh, this is something, this is something that uh, bring us to the, um, um, uh, to what um, I was going to say now. If it is about, or if it would have been about building a common European policy on migration and asylum, this should have been uh, signaled months ago. And I doubt there would have been critical voices. As I said, to the proposed, to successive proposals uh, put on table by successive European commissions on activating a common policy for addressing migration and asylum, Austria was always against. And there is something else I will then uh, uh, resume myself, uh, I, I would uh, uh, just uh, refrain myself to this. The truth is that Romania is not on the Balkanic route. It's not there. The Balkanic route goes to Greece, has affected Bulgaria, and Bulgaria worked against the situation back in 2015 with all its might as it could at that time. It comes from the policy, um, the visa, visa policy of uh, Belgrade applies, which is a very, is not strict at all, it's very loose. Indian citizens, for example, 
could enter Serbia with no visa whatsoever. The same goes for Bangladesh. Uh, and uh, uh, since Chancellor Nehammer addressed the need to register um, uh, asylums or um, uh, those migrants in general, I would gently remind him that Hungary doesn't register them. So what is the case of Austria now it has no, let's say, uh, 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 stands no comparison with what was happening back in 2015. The truth is that out of this year, there have been 100,000 migrants who filed for asylum in Austria. Out of each 75,000 are in Austria in this moment. Um, but again, it's not through Romania. Physically, it's, it's completely unattractive. Physically, it's unattractive. There were some Romanian journalists who went to Triskirchen in south, uh, the south of Vienna and interviewed those who were there. And um, they all said, we came through Serbia, mm. to Serbia and Hungary. That's where our surprise stands from. Thank you. So we see that actually Austria's veto came as a complete surprise and, and is found as something um, unfair on the Romanian side. And in Bulgaria, there is some understanding to it. But let's now look at it from the European perspective. And I'm turning to you, Sebastian. You have been observing the debate of this Schengen accession for a very long time. Uh, we work together, I follow you on Twitter, so I saw that in response to, to the veto retweeted that, sing, I quote, single domestic interests have blocked progress regarding enlargement and foreign policy, end of quote. Uh, could you maybe tell us what does veto means to the EU? What does it actually say about EU? Is it a symptom of deeper tensions within the European Union or should be perceived as a part of you know, this mechanism that gives smaller countries also an equal say in European matters? Well, thank you. I mean, I am uh, also as uh, surprised as uh, probably everyone here. It's a, it's a very, um, in that sense, one-sided uh, composition of, of this panel, um, but uh, I, I can only echo that. And uh, I, I was surprised and I think it's, uh, it's um, a symptom that we have seen, and this is the, the tweet that you are referring to that, that I meant, um, is that we have a decision by the European Commission that gives a recommendation. And then single countries all of a sudden come and try to gain whatever. We haven't determined what, what here the reason might be. We, I'm, 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 I can't really judge if uh, how, how valid the demands from the Netherlands are. Um, but what I can judge is Bulgaria has been among the countries who have used their veto power, for instance, when it came to enlargement. We've seen that in, in, in other um, varieties uh, with regards to the financial aid package for Ukraine. Um, we see that from Hungary. Um, and now we have seen that with regards to Schengen coming from Austria. There are other countries. And what I'm afraid of is why are we not listening to the supranational um, institution that we have on a European level? Because when we want to stick to rules and if we want to um, apply those rules that become more technical, um, the, the longer European integration runs, why are we then not following these recommendations? Or I would even go further, why are we giving single countries the possibility to veto this. So um, I've been advocating for, for taking away um, the unanimity in, in foreign policy for, for quite some time uh, now as well. And I think that when we have a thorough assessment by the European Commission, when we have um, a thorough recommendation that uh, a decision uh, can be taken, um, then we should also have the possibility for um, these countries to being um, accessing Schengen, accessing uh, membership, uh, or not blocking uh, support um, and solidarity uh, to, to, to our neighboring uh, countries. And um, I mean, uh, Daniela sort of coined this term vetoism. 
um, that that uh, lies uh, in opposition to to this supranationalism, and um, is something that I think even goes beyond this idea of um, the, the the Europe of nations that is advocated from from uh, the, the the more uh, radical conservative uh, parties and also uh, Eurosceptic um, um, politicians. I think that uh, there is a real um, challenge that after the solidarity that we've experienced um, after the, the unprovoked and unjustified attack of the Russian Federation on Ukraine, where the European Union and its member states very much surprised us, and especially, I guess, um, the, um, the uh, current regime in, in Moscow uh, with its unanimity and, and solidarity, that these kind of vetoisms are the first cracks in this, and nobody profits from it. Not we in Austria, not we as Europeans, um, of course, not the Romanians, not the Bulgarians, that's obvious in, in that case, uh, but also not our, our immediate neighbors and the people that are in need um, uh, um, uh, and, and ask for, for asylum and affected by this, uh, they only profit um, for, for the people uh, that are sitting in the Kremlin. I add something, Malvina, to what uh, to what Sebastian said. Briefly, just, yeah. just briefly, mm -hmm. it created well not the, all the vetoes, but the veto of Austria and the veto of the Netherlands against uh, directly against Bulgaria, it recreated the, the the impression that Europe, the United, our United Europe, functions with different standards. Mm -hmm. You know, it's a double standard. And what was even worse. Now, at, at, let's say, at a level of communication, very much as the predecessor, Mr. Um, uh, of the Chancellor of actual, uh, Mr. Nehammer, of the actual Chancellor of uh, Austria, uh, Mr. Kurz, he had the same, in, in my opinion, non-European behavior when communicating political decisions. They do it, and this is what Karl Nehammer did, through the media first, to gather the attention of the locals instead of presenting it in different circumstances, circumstances where the representatives of the EU countries would have been. And this works against the very feeling of unity, as we would want it. And actually, at a time like this, the unity is actually what we need, especially that Romania is also a neighboring country of uh, Ukraine, exactly. which, which has been attacked. Um, but you mentioned that um, there is this feeling of double standards in the EU. We, we, we spoke a little bit about how the societies in Bulgaria and Romania reacted, but could you maybe elaborate a little more on that? Do you think that there is some sort of disillusionment with the EU right now, or, and not only with Austria and the Netherlands? Is there room for more Euroscepticism that can kind of come in right now? What is the attitude actually towards the EU in both countries? Uh, shall I start or Vladislav? Maybe, maybe Vladislav. <laughs> sure, of course. Um, look, the Bulgarian public is in general supportive of the European Union and, and, and perceives certain benefits from it. Although I must point out that the support uh, is trending down. So on the latest Eurobarometer survey from the, from the, from the spring, we see it around 48-49% of positive feeling towards the EU, which is uh, below the average of the EU already. Um, but it places higher trust in the institution than its own institutions. And we've discussed that in a different format, where Bulgarians don't trust their parliament above 80%, don't trust their parliament or their government 70%. So, so there, is, there, there is a support. But very much, uh, uh, very much uh, what Mr. Um, Undureanu mentioned is this, um, this feeling of double standards or the feeling of being unwanted or perceived as unable. Um, and uh, and what, what the Bulgaria sees is that when the country doesn't perform, rightfully so, is being uh, punished through according mechanisms. It's name shamed. There are certain mechanisms that are take, uh, taken upon the, uh, upon the government. But when it performs, it's still somehow punished at the end of the day. Um, and so this, this really runs deep than uh, what, is, uh, what is the worth of being in the EU, then setting these anti-European sentiments um, 
in a higher pace. And just don't rem- uh, just, just don't forget that in Bulgaria, Bulgaria is among the most pro-Russian oriented uh, public that we have right now in in Europe. Um, And this is quite important. And yesterday, the Commissioner for Internal Affairs mentioned the only winner from this decision is sitting in Kremlin right now. And and, and this is very much uh, what is the danger with Bulgaria because um, you know, from our uh, Globsec trend survey, we, we see that uh, still 30% of, of people consider Russia as a strategic partner. Um, they still think about 26% think that uh, the West has provoked Russia to attack Ukraine. This is this is not a small, small percentage. Um, and yes, indeed, uh, 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 Vladimir Putin's uh, positive rating dropped from last year from 70% to 29% this year, but it's still the highest in the region. So, so it's a quite dangerous uh, setting that, uh, that that it's being um, it, it it could materialize itself, and and uh, because the public it's not perhaps as knowledgeable enough to understand why one or two member states can just override the EU as they understand it, the blame eventually will be placed on the the EU. Uh, and here is where the uh, here is where the populist, the anti-EU, the uh, pro-Russian segments can gain very highly uh, in Bulgaria and very quickly in Bulgaria. Um, just to note that uh, we are also among the highest in the region who believe in conspiracy theories. Um, about more than 40, uh, 54 percent uh, believed in an average of three conspiracy theories in our recent study. So. Uh, again, highest in the region. So it's a very dangerous setup that we're observing at the moment. And maybe just to comment quickly on Sebastian, what he mentioned about about the EU as well, that um, indeed, if we see that the the set processes and mechanisms, the rules are just highly disregarded, are disregarded in a high pace of political, with political decision make decisions, then even those that are really believers in uh, how essential the EU and what the format, essential format it is, it's starting to wonder what is the point. Then why do we have those rules? Why do we have these institutions? Why do we, how can we move forward if the political decisions are becoming not the precedent, but more so of the norm? So this is another dangerous tendency that I am observing myself as well, Sebastian. Yeah, as for the case of Romania, the situation is uh, diametrically opposed in terms of um, social mentalities and symbolic acceptance of, uh, of Russia. Um, uh, the, 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 the support for the European Union and the support for Romania's membership in the European Union has not gone down at all. It stays around 80%. So Romania is a very, I would say, very uh, EU optimistic from this point of view. There is a party uh, which is, could be considered fringe political formation in the parliament, the so-called Alliance for the Unity of Romanians, which um, uh, from time to time um, agitates the idea that the European Union is um, against, works against the interests of the strategic interests of Romania. Their voice toned down once Russia invaded Ukraine, and they were perceived and are perceived more and more of this political, the members of this political formation as to Putin's propagandists in Romania. So therefore they're marginalized. Once this happened, nevertheless, the blame was not, did not fall onto um, um, uh, the European Union, but onto, Aust- onto Austria in particular. Um, uh, that was dubbed, um, uh, Austria was dubbed as working against the unity at the level of the European Union. And what um, made the, uh, uh, what made Romanians th- uh, think this way was very much the fact that behind the um, uh, decision to take Romania and Bulgaria into the European Union was the European Commission and the European Parliament setting for. Meaning that it's not the problem of the institutions, is the problem, happened to be the problem of one country who vetoed for ununderstandable, very vague political reasons. If, and I'm coming back to the issue of communication, if this could have been explained in a way as it was the case of the Netherlands, it was the case of Sweden, then things could, could, I 
think so, at least in theory, could have been turned around. But it came out of nowhere. And therefore, now the large public uh, in, in Romania finger points at Austria as one of the countries who's trying to um, uh, minimize the, the EU logic aspirations for unity. The more that we have a conflict, a war going on very close to our eastern border. Thank you. Now I'd like to talk about another country that was mentioned a couple of times by Bruce Sebastian and Mihai. I mean, uh, Hungary, because as Sebastian already mentioned, Hungary has been notorious for, notorious for using its veto, mostly as a tool of enforcing concessions on unrelated issues. And Mihai mentioned that actually Hungary is the country that doesn't register um, migrants. migrants anymore. Um, so just recently, we also um, experienced that Hungary has been blocking aid package for Ukraine. And it dropped um, this, this uh, veto only two days ago. Um, I'm going to uh, quote uh, another tweet, this time by Daniela, uh, who recently tweeted that these days the EU policy of Hungary and Austria um, is becoming actually hard to talk from one another. Um, so, Daniela, can we compare Austria's veto to that of Hungary? Do you see more color parallels here? Is Austria uh, going also into this direction of policy making like, like Hungary or is it too far fetched? I mean, I'm, I have been observing Hungary for, I don't know, 10, 15 years now. And um, I think it, it wouldn't be a comparison to, to really say that this is the same. Because in, in the end, what we see now, this is just a, a similar tactics, maybe. A similar um, way of of, of make, getting these concessions, maybe, or or having a leverage or creating a leverage. So I wouldn't compare it in this way. We were jokingly talking about this vetoism as a, as a general problem, maybe, um, but especially because I think uh, of this frustrations we we had already with with Hungary and with other cases that were, as you pointed out so well, it's not the veto itself that is the problem, it's the unexplained one and the not legitimate veto that we cannot work with because you cannot address it, it's not tangible, as also Vladi said. So I'm not, um, let's say, a, a fan of, of, uh, of avoiding any situation or recreating a system where you cannot veto to make it easier and get quicker solutions and everything. I'm rather a fan of thinking what is behind these vetoes and um, what are the actual reasons behind and is it legitimate to, to veto something. And um, maybe to make it clear is also that um, uh, the, the politicization, you, you mentioned the, the question of you, you make a, a topic a topic and um, emotionalize it, even if it hasn't been very much in the public yet. And this is the I think a new mechanism or a new dynamic that gets into EU politics. You know, a few years ago, we haven't talked much about foreign politics on an EU level at all. So it's something very new, I think, for member states to engage on an EU level in foreign affairs uh, and also to use this uh, in, a, in a constructive way, in a deconstructive way uh, to, there you have parties and actors who use uh, this general Euro skepticism uh, for for this matter, so it's much more complex, I think, than just a systemic failure. Uh, in in my regard, it's a, a much broader issue that we are facing. And Orban was, uh, as usual, a populist and very uh, professional politician who who knows how to use these weak spots and this new disorientation. And I think also Austria in this case maybe might have used it. Mm -hmm. Um, but let me also ask you a follow-up question. What was the reaction of Hungary to the to Austria's veto? How was it perceived there? Yeah, of course, Hungary was kind of, uh, I think, happy that it was not the one to be blamed in this case, maybe. Uh, so you saw uh, some kind of reactions like, yeah, look, um, the, uh, if we veto, there is a huge outcry. If, if Austria does, um, it's, it's only in Eastern Europe, Western Europe stays passive mm -hmm. uh, in this regard. So there was this 
double standard uh, argument as well coming, of course. Mm, you also saw um, the reaction regarding Romania, for example, since there's this Hungarian uh, minority in, in, in Transylvania, they uh, pretty much blamed uh, the, the Romanian administration for uh, saying that this is their own fault that uh, Austria uh, didn't, didn't agree. Of course, this is uh, also without much of a basis. But of course, you see that, again, domestic uh, yeah, it's used for domestic purposes and for, for conflicts that have been there before. Thank you, Peter. Thank you, Adam. I think that, that uh, uh, the question of Hungary should be also addressed in a different way. Um, uh, on a rational basis, Hungary's foreign policy in terms of Schengen was to, 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 to get itself as far as possible from an external border. So this is why the reaction of Mr. Siarto, the Hungarian Minister of Foreign Affairs, was to blame the situation created by the Austrian veto. Again, reaffirming that Bulgaria and Romania would have had been absolutely um, uh, uh, prepared to join the Schengen space. It came out 48 hours after the veto. And again, on a rational basis, it's absolutely logical because it's better for Hungary itself to have the external, the external border, not the EU, but the Schengen Eastern border on River Put and not on the Romanian, uh, on the Romanian Hungarian, uh, Hungarian border. So therefore, again, things are, cannot, uh, I mean, all this information and data that we amass here uh, in our webinar, they would not paradoxically explain what happened. Mm -hmm. It only thickens the fog. Thank you for, for, for this remark. Yeah, and for, yeah, yeah I comment sure. to that because you, you heard also voices saying like, um, because of the rule of law situation in Hungary and Austria is aware of this as well, even if they collaborate and cooperate in many different ways. Uh, Hungary is not a very reliant partner when it comes to migration politics, sure. a constructive migration politics, you know, because Austria has still a bit of a different focus. It wants a certain constructive way because it's not apart from the, the way of the Geneva Convention and human rights in Hungary you have a complete um, contestation of, of, of asylum as a principle you know so these are two different worlds what we are talking about still and so perhaps it was a possibility to bring in uh, to, to change the, the, the border let's say to change also the allies and cooperation partners when it comes to migration. If I may, just one one supplementary remark. Something that came out of this um, uh, of this uh, utter lack of explanations again disrupts the very sense, the very fabric of unity alongside the European Union, simply because it is about myths. The fact that experts of various origins have alluded to the fact that Croatia has bought its membership in the Schengen space. Because uh, Mr. Nehammer was there in a bilateral visit and he was offering the possibility, offered the possibility to have access to the LNG terminal in Kirk Island. And uh, then the Croatians have said that if the Schengen doesn't happen, then um, a major Austrian uh, infrastructural firms would not be uh, able to access uh, uh, Different offers um, uh, in in, uh, uh, in in Croatia. This is something that, beyond its very cynical meaning, um, comes along the other myths, proving that a political decision can be turned around by a sort of a uh, by a sort of a market-like kind of deal which doesn't make Croatia feel better, but doesn't make Austria look better at all. And this is to, this is to stay in the social mentalities of European citizens, mostly in the East. It's true because this enhances this, this uh, kind of stereotypes and this yeah. we have about Austria and, and, and Romania and Bulgaria. Um, Sebastian, I would also like to ask you if you want to comment on that, but I have another question for you regarding the EU. Um, so maybe let me ask, last ask it, and if you want to 
comment yeah. on, on what others said. And yeah. Of course, go ahead. So um, Daniela uses the term vetoism. Um, and I, asked, like, I would like to ask you if you think that vetoism and those blockages which we observe uh, in the EU are becoming a new normal in the, in the EU policy. You know, is it now a way of countering EU policies, manifesting discontent instead of seeking compromise? Yeah. Well, um, I think that this, this blockages and uh, not being able to move forward is inherent to the history of European integration. And we had the, 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 the period of the empty chair where decisions couldn't be taken because there was only unanimity and, and France didn't show up for certain decisions. And then um, we, we introduced with uh, the, with the um, single European Act, the, um, the qualified majority in certain areas, and they have been expanded ever since. And now only a couple of policies remain. But it's exactly those politics that we talk about. It's foreign policy, it's taxation, uh, asylum migration. Um, and that should give us a hint. Yeah? I mean, apparently, even in, 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 in cases yeah, um, where there would be unanimity, uh, not a requirement, uh, decisions in the council are taken unanimously. More than 70%, up to, up to 80% of the decisions where QMV would be enough are taken unanimously because there are discussions, there are negotiations, and at the end we arrive at the compromise, which is the ideal, um, uh, so to say, uh, looking for the, the smallest common denominator that benefits all of the EU member countries. But then we seem to have some sort of controversial points where we end up very often in this case where we are now sitting together and speculating about what is the reason, and that gives possibilities for these myths. There is, um, and I would have a, a slightly different opinion here uh, than Daniela, um, because I think that especially in foreign policy, these, these uh, usages of, of blocking yeah, with the argumentation, we need, uh, we cannot have QMB because we need to respect each and every uh, country um, and each and every uh, opinion, uh, regardless of how big or how small they are. Um, I would agree with that, but why would we give it to a single country? And we have a qualified majority where we make decisions with 55% of the member states representing 65% of the population. We could make a super majority that then respects a little bit more if, if there are concerns. I'm not good with, with numbers. I'm a political scientist, so I, I, I can't really do the math on, on what, what would be necessary here. But giving it to a single country this is, is something where I would say uh, we, we, um, we end up in, in these type of situations because ultimately, um, and I'm more referring here to uh, the, the vetoes that were done with regards to enlargement and with regards to uh, financial aid to, to Ukraine, uh, but maybe also to the, to the Schengen decision that the, the, the reasons that are given for that are not the ones uh, that we are uh, discussing about. And, um, Ultimately, they will have to return and work together on something else. And if we continue with, we veto this for whatever reason, this will exponentially rise and, and lead to even more uh, discontent um, in the future. And then we might end up in a situation where we cannot find any uh, for, foreign policy um, um, uh, uh, common denominator on a European level. Uh, anymore. And additionally, of course, I mean, the, the timing is, is terrible. Um, when, when these news about the, the, the corruption in, uh, within the European Parliament come out, uh, we, have, uh, we have countries like Vladi mentioned, Bulgaria trusts the, Parliament, the European Parliament or the EU institutions more than their own institutions. Um, but people will start questioning, is the EU functioning? And not everyone in, in like the Romanian society is so, so maybe uh, well versed to, to uh, distinguish uh, on that uh, specific uh, decision because in general, my observation when I, when I talk uh, with people is rather that there is a, there is a blame on Brussels, whatever that is, um, even if it's taken by, by single member states. And that means that with um, 
not being able to move forward, extortion, uh, blackmailing, um, single countries trying to, to exploit it for their own benefit. And then additionally, on top of that, single members of the European Parliament um, apparently being um, uh, corrupt uh, is, 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 is a perfect uh, storm for, for uh, the, the, a, a rise of Euroscepticism, which worries me very, very uh, much for the, for the future of, of Europe. Would like to add something on to it? Yes, just very quickly, um, just to tag along to Sebastian's remarks. Um, it's two dimensions when we talk about uh, the, the use of veto unanimity um, and QMV. And uh, on one hand, the dimension is internal, what, what Sebastian was talking about here about the EU citizens, how they see it and what it means to them, and what are the dangerous tendencies that we may start seeing, you know, these uh, dangerous waters uh, next early next year with what you said, the perfect storm between uh, between the, the, the corruption allegations within the um, European Parliament, uh, but also about also these acts of one or two member states. On the other hand, there is the external dimension, and this is how the European Union is being perceived outside. Um, and so with, with the ability, we, we are claiming that we are a global actor and we are having this external action that uh, we want to be effective and to be coherent and to be credible and to be sustainable. But at the other hand, uh, our partners and allies and, and those that might not be our friends necessarily see that one member states can, can stumble the whole block at once. Um, and so, yeah, this does bring the discussion back to unanimity versus the QMV. Um, and as you said, their mechanism set to protect to protect uh, one way or another uh, smaller um, smaller uh, member states. Uh, so that so they are represented in that decision. And last, maybe to, to mention back to more of the internal dimension uh, on the member state level, we don't see the typical block that we used to see. We don't see the V4 block anymore. We don't see, uh, th those countries are starting to move around and to ally themselves by an issue and not by geographically where they're located more often than not anymore. So we should not keep on going back that do you see the Central and Eastern Europe will be left, left behind, not necessarily anymore. So this is to me another argument to think about forward on uh, how QMV mechanisms can be applied further. And it doesn't have to be necessarily through an outright tre treaty change. There are mechanisms, there are sleeping beauties, as, as some call them, in the current legal framework that can, uh, that, that can start to be um, used um, further. And those that are, have nev never been used, maybe to, it's time to try them out. Thank you. Uh, yes, sure. <laughs> Sorry, one, one comment to add is just that if we if we go further for this uh, to to tackle Euroscepticism within the EU, we don't consider that uh, it wouldn't change anything for the population uh, on sides uh, if uh, the EU would, for example, uh, find an agreement because of the unanimous uh, the um, voting change of voting system because of the of the I would say power of the, of the governments, the, the power over media, the power of the public discourse. So in the end, we have uh, the worst case scenario, for example, in, in that uh, if uh, Auburn, for example, would not uh, get his veto through, you know, if things would, uh, would go the way he doesn't uh, intend, nevertheless, he has the control of, of change the discourse and, and, and fuel the Euroscepticism, perhaps even more, actually. Because then it's clearly the, the, the victimization, you know, argument is then very, very strong, of course, and it's, it's institutionalized. So that's just a risk that I see. So we might come to a decision, but we still have to deal with the disparities and divides and the populist actors on site who we don't get rid of just by changing the system. Mm -hmm. uh... Following that, Daniela, I'd actually like to ask you, you know, um, what, what is your take on this uh, decision making at the European level and ca how can we avoid vetoes from countries like Austria and Hungary in the future? What are the measures to, to, to improve it? I mean, it's a question at all of you, but I will start with, with you. Yeah, yeah of course. Um... There, there are some sleeping, uh, sleeping beauties as uh, the political scientists are much better informed than me, I would say. 
But uh, just aside from the systemic parts, uh, I'm more uh, thinking about the, the question of discourse and decision making in, in the public uh, sphere and in general integration of, of Europe on this on this level. So this is, I think, something that is neglected still uh, when we talk European politics. And what we also don't talk about when it comes to foreign politics, for example, is the question of ownership and the question of responsibilities taken over by member states. We have so many member states that stay or remain um, passive on many, many issues. But we focus only on the on Fort Terrible, you know, on, on this uh, Victor Orban, on Kaczynski, on uh, whoever, you know we know, the, we know the people. So what we don't talk about is those people who, who are not engaged in foreign politics because they might not be geographically affected or they have a different perception of Europe in general and different um, allies outside of Europe and so on. So I would really focus as a European Union more on um, allies in, in this direction, on engaging uh, member states. There was one idea I found interesting. I, I, it was new to me to, for example, have um, uh, different um, um, kind of um, ambassadors of, 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 for EU affairs uh, from different countries. And this is changing all the time so that EU doesn't have to speak from one, with one voice anymore, but uh, kind of get rid of this, this, this myth of one voice to Europe, but rather that uh, foreign policy is, is spoken by different, different voices from, from different areas, of course, of, of, of the EU, this I found an interesting mm -hmm. approach uh, in, in literature. Well, for some small countries, I imagine it's difficult to have capacities to deal with all challenges on the foreign policy, which is why they very often just take the the stance of the European Union. Definitely, and we don't have the European public sphere and we don't have a discourse only when the outrage is there uh, and then only certain actors are actually on the table talking about certain issues. Mm -hmm. So this might also increase the pressure, you know, if more get engaged, the pressure increases on those who might come up with a complete unlegitimized veto. Uh, I would like to remind our audience as well, if you have questions, then feel free to post them in, in the chat window, either on uh, YouTube or in Zoom. Uh, Gloria, our assistant, will, will send, us, send them to us. But let me turn to you. Do, do you want to comment on that? Is What measures can be taken to, to improve decision making at the European level? At least, at least at the level of uh, uh, those who are uh, somehow experienced in foreign policy, international relations business, so in general, what happened with Austria, and paradoxically, from a symbolic point of view, less with Hungary, was very much what made the UN and the OSC completely uh, um, um, uh, useless when uh, when uh, in 2014 Russia to Crimea and in February this year uh, 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 unleashed the aggression against uh, Ukraine because they were because the uh, UN uh, Security Council and because the Permanent Council of the OSC both institutions are hostages to the veto procedure so it, in a way it mirrors what happened there with what has happened with the Austrian voice, or with the Austrian veto. But then there is a question, again, coming to rationality, since we are all, in a way or another, close to neorealism from this point of view. Um, what made the Chancellor put the, 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 the regional foreign policy of Austria into such a difficult position? Because Austria was the most important advocate for uh, Southeast European countries' integration in the European Union or general structures, including NATO. Although Austria is, is um, um, uh, a neutral country, it always advocated on behalf of the Southeast European countries. It was a promoter of uh, EU integration in various formats, sometimes against the position of Berlin or the position of Paris. So, and then the veto. And let me uh, wind up by saying again, this is, at least from our point of view, completely un understandable. Um, if, if, if I just 
briefly made to the to the point that also Daniela made. Yeah? Um, we listen to the troublemakers yeah? and not to, for instance, small countries like the Baltics or Finland. They, in the current situation, have been warning and 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 been resilient and have been been very uh, well in um, dealing with with the situation that was brought upon in the first uh, place, uh, Ukraine, but then also ultimately all of us, uh, because uh, I know I, I say it uh, very often, but the, that's an attack on all of us, not only uh, Ukraine. They have been dealing with this on a foreign policy and also a security level very well, but we don't talk about the Estonians, we don't talk about the Lithuanians, the, the Finns that, that have been championing um, foreign policy on a on an EU level. We talk about the ones who who, who make the trouble, uh, who prevent. Um, and if we don't talk about the troublemakers, we talk about Berlin and we talk about Paris. We don't talk about Central Europe um, in in that case. And I know I might sound like a like a broken record, but uh, I I say uh, treaty change is definitely. Necessary. We need to rethink how decision making on a European level functions, and we need to diminish the influence of a single country, regardless of its size, regardless of its economy, regardless of its history whatsoever. Because, and um, yeah, there are some sleeping sleeping beauties. You call the, the things in the in the treaties. Yeah, maybe I'm, I'm, maybe they are beautiful. I don't know uh, that much, but. I'm afraid that if we pursue, for instance, this two-speed Europe, yeah, which would be one of the things that, that are there, yeah, enhanced cooperation procedures, et cetera, um, I think we are, we are further uh, strengthening what we see now, uh, which is not a two-speed Europe, it's a two-class Europe. And we need to, we need to overcome um, uh, this rather than, than uh, uh, deepening these, um, I don't want to say trenches, but it's probably true. Yeah. Uh, Lai, do you want to add something to it? I think we spent enough time um, talking, but uh, something that, that uh, Daniela mentioned about, uh, it struck with me about the political will, the political responsibility, that uh, while the systematic changes are a part, another part, it, it's not the only part that can, can improve our situation and improve our union. Um, and so yeah, it, it, it was just... Uh, it reflected to me because uh, in a recent study that, that we did with the 58 interviews for national policymaker elites in uh, 14 different member state countries, uh, what, we, what we saw is that countries, for example, like Belgium, that is very much pro-reform, pro-new treaty, pro-QMV and what have you, but they don't step up to the plate when it comes to political responsibility. Like you said, Sebastian, we don't hear uh, some are passive and some don't don't take uh, take that chance. Um, Cyprus usually another example ready to ready to jump on most cases, but then we see boom with Belarus a few years ago suddenly a veto that is not connected again not explain does not connect to the to the matter of the day. It was connected to another issue. Um, so yeah, so so to me it's three elements. Uh, one would be uh, the stru the structural reforms, uh, the structural element, the other will be the political will slash political responsibility. And third would be uh, still working on this uh, building the, the common strategic culture, right? So if we want to overcome something, we need to have this com commonality, this, this common strategic culture. Um, so this is kind of my remarks that it's, uh, it's a multiple elements that are in play here. Thank you. We have one question in the chat, but before I uh, read it out, I also have a question, which I would like to read Sebastian, about West, the Western Balkans. Yeah, I, if you want to reply to it, feel free as well. Because what message does this veto send and what can it mean to the countries of Western Balkans? Austria, as we have also mentioned, was usually advocating for them, also against other capitals very often. But what should they feel like now when the mythical bridge builder is actually burning bridges to some countries well in 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 a paradoxical way here we have seen a very uh, high support for uh, granting um, bosnia and herzegovina candidate status which happened uh, yesterday from from austria and and austria has been uh, 
uh, of very much uh, advocating um, the um, integration of, of the Western Balkan countries into the European Union. But of course, I mean, the, the, the message that, that is there could be, and that extends to, to uh, basically um, also uh, countries that are now candidates, uh, Moldova, Ukraine, but also um, countries of, of the European neighborhood policy is that uh, whatever you do, how much you try, whatever reforms you put in place, there might always be a reason that you cannot anticipate. Yeah? And as, as, as Mihai uh, said, um, apparently there was no back channeling on a, on a diplomatic level, and it came to a surprise, not only to us, but also on, on the diplomatic level, um, where I would say that the danger is that it shows you it doesn't matter what you do, there might be something coming up when you fulfill these things in one or two years, because you can't anticipate what the what the what what the lay of the land at that at that time will be, um, and this is a this is a dangerous sign for for the willingness to actually undergo transformation because these transformations are painful and um, uh, I wouldn't see that there is a lot of enthusiasm left after almost two decades of of this um, potential candidates uh, countries in the Western Balkans to to, to, to undergo uh, that risk. Um, and uh, yeah. Thank you. So um, there are two questions in chat from King, from King Gabuji, his current colleague. Uh, while speaking about EU migration policy and Schengen, Schengen zone, we have not mentioned yet Frontex. How do you evaluate, evaluate its work, given the recent accusations of pushbacks that resulted in stepping down of its uh, executive director? And what role should it play in managing EU borders? I mean, we know that uh, Frontex had also had its own data, but uh, the Austrian government didn't seem to rely on it. It relied on other data, and this just data came to very different conclusions. Uh, would you like to? Who would like to, to respond to Kinga's question? I'll just briefly say that the the. Um, Arguments the um, um, Romanian Ministry of Interior invoked by the time of, of Austria's veto were very much the arguments provided by Frontex. And Frontex proved to be very efficient in terms of uh, inter member, inter EU members' cooperation at the level of um, uh, bringing down transborder criminality, uh, illegal trafficking of all kinds and stuff. <clears throat> On the other hand, the data provided by the Austrian government, uh, or at least by the Ministry, by the Ministry of Interior, were somehow surprising. So, what we uh, in their succession, what we uh, learned first was the, uh, the, the 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 political decision, and then when the wave of protests reached. A certain height, here comes someone who's a technical director in the Ministry of Interior, the Federal Ministry of Interior, with some data which can be seen as data, but unfundamented data that have been not, that um, uh, uh, there has been no, no, no room for further technical explanation. And that again uh, uh, added. Um, um, uh, sadness to to the veto itself because since you cannot invoke uh, on a serious base um, uh, uh, technical data no matter how particular would have been for the Austrian um, uh, Ministry for uh, Ministry of Interior then the decision is once again blatantly political blatantly political now when it comes to Frontex Austria had also had, like all other EU member countries, had access to the Frontex data. They have never been put under criticism. They were so, they, they have their own algorithm, algorithms, they're very technical. Uh, the way they are collected has been um, uh, already a matter of, um, let's say, um, uh, a statistical tradition. It's a mechanism to which all EU member countries interested in Frontex to Frontex activities cooperated for quite a long time ago. Um, so 
there's nothing that there's something that cannot be uh, contradicted. And when it comes to the data provided by the Austrian Ministry of Interior, some issues there were also, in a way, um, uh, uh, overpassing the, the the limit, the technical limit the Frontex has. For example, like um, uh, foreign into the data of, uh, of private telephone, mobile telephones, which uh, is connected, or at least is very close to a breach of rule addressing individual data. So it's that has not added consistency to the decision as such. And again, Frontex is Frontex, it works, and it works pretty well. I think it's the best mechanism that we have at the moment, yeah. right? Okay, there's another uh, question from Kinga, unless someone would like to add something. Uh, do you think European political community launched by President Macron uh, became a new hub for coalition building within the EU? <laughs> uh, can I? Well, <laughs> I mean, we uh, to, together with uh, with uh, um, Ulrich Neck and I wrote this uh, this uh, infamous uh, policy paper <laughs> on uh, on uh, the, our idea of a greater European Council, and I think that a, a greater European Council would be would be the perfect format uh, to do so. But um, well, we're we're not there yet. So uh, until then, we need to we need to work with uh, maybe the the European uh, political community. I still think that the that the that the name is uh, uh, is not very very suitable. Also, um, but that's that's a different story. It stems back to a time where actually again uh, decision making uh, and further European integration have been blocked by one country. In that case, the French National Assembly, because that uh, European political uh, community was was an idea um, uh, already in in the 1950s, um, which which then didn't didn't materialize. Um, so uh, I I don't think it's a stew that you can reheat and it becomes better. But um, will it be a, a a good format to to find coalitions? I think if we go past the the photo opportunities, uh, which was great at that time to bring together. How many 40, 44, 40, 48 ish countries in times uh, where there is a war um, expanded on the European continent um, to show that there is a there are other ways to 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 make foreign policy um, was was a was a good uh, picture. But one of the things that is is very very uh, problematic on the European level um, is this rather focusing on, we said, uh, troublemakers, but also these photo opportunities. And we always see how uh, the, the um, heads of, of state or government um, are coming together and uh, are on the family picture. But this is not the actual forum where, where the decisions are made. The decisions are made in the council um, that, that then blocks something like that. In that case, uh, be it the ministers of the interior or, or foreign ministers or, or whatsoever. And uh, therefore, if we can move past this, uh, uh, the, the good pictures and Macron talking to, to uh, Aliyev and, and Pashinyan, um, where not much sort of happened to, to alleviate the situation uh, yet, if we move past that, then yes, maybe, um, but maybe. Uh, there is one more, oh yeah, go ahead, Vladi. Just very quickly, um, yeah, I would agree. As long as the uh, we agree with you, Sebastian, that I think that it's a it's a at the end of the day a more positive than negative type of a format in a sense that it can be a good fill the pulse format where there can be uh, it cannot it's not just about the EU and it's not just about the bilateral relations with the third countries, but it's about a broader spectrum of somewhat like-minded actors that come together and actually discuss uh, current issues, current crises to feel the pulse. And I think that can be a helpful mechanism. I will be a bit more skeptical if it becomes too institutionalized, one, and two, uh, worried if uh, if uh, these uh, frames that initially were, were pushed upon it a little bit as an alternative to enlargement, 
if this persists, this myth again, <laughs> back to myths, then then that that will then uh, crush it down to the ground, and and that would not be a helpful uh, format. But as such as filling the polls, I see it as something positive. Should I answer the question of uh, of the elections as well? <laughs> Let me, let me read it out. So, because the last question is for you, should we expect new elections in Bulgaria, or does the government has a chance to be voted in? Uh, yeah, it's actually it's actually connected to 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 what we're talking today about uh, because uh, um, it could be a condition helping for the government to be elected. I don't think that it's the only and the one, the impetus will be just, just the one that pushed through the threshold, but it will be one of the considerations because the current uh, discussion in this course in Bulgaria is that we need stability. Look what is happening. Uh, we are being sidelined. Uh, we really need a, a government, a, a long-standing government. So this pushes towards the possibility of electing the government. However, I would not be the one saying that, yes, I would say 50-50 at the moment. Um, and I wouldn't be very surprised of new elections in, in March. Because we're slowly coming to an end, let me ask one generic question at all of you. Considering everything that has been said and discussed today, what do you think should be done, can be done, what can we do that those two countries, Bulgaria and Romania, can join Schengen zone? Speaking from your regional perspectives, professional perspectives, and I would say we can be very brief. <laughs> Who would like to start? I mean, we mentioned. Okay, I, I'm quite optimistic that that it will come to that because, as there are no no tangible reasons made by Austria, I cannot imagine that the veto will you know, keep on remaining very long. I think it's a tactical thing. So I don't know, let's wait for the for the summit. Uh, let's wait what's, what's decided there and um, how the five demands that were kind of um, spontaneously written together, <laughs> as it seems, uh, are, are being tackled and, and uh, attention is being given and press conferences are being made. Then I can imagine that Austria will find back to its uh, track uh, very soon. And at least this, this, um, this opposing um, position is also a question of the past. So in this regard, I'm, I'm, I want to be optimistic. If you look as concretely at this, uh, at this um, demand, um, this is nothing new, uh, at least uh, uh, nothing that, that Austria didn't also have the chance to work on it already uh, together uh, with other partners. And um, yeah, so. Let's, let's see a bit, let's wait a bit. That's the Austrian attitude, I know. But... <laughs> <laughs> can, can I be a little uh, less optimistic, which is usually uh, the case here? Actually, um, really different opinions. <laughs> um, I, I think that, uh, while I agree what you have said, um, I'm afraid that there might just other countries coming up with something. Uh, um, and then it's it's another country that, that is going to veto this. And uh, therefore, if you ask what we can do, I think we need to talk about this. We need to inform much more and we need to drive this discourse so that it's not um, something that happens out of the blue and then um, uh, everybody is surprised, but rather uh, talk more about what EU policies and EU decisions uh, that are taken by uh, member states will have as an effect on the whole um, of Europe, but even more specifically, because maybe more relatable also, especially on the, on the immediate neighborhood and, and region. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's wait and hope for the best. Let's talk more sure. and let's have more debates. Maybe Vladi? Sure, absolutely. Absolutely, yes. Um, I also would say not to wait and see um, attitudes in this case, uh, definitely a diplomatic pressure. Diplomatic pressure on Austria and the Bulgarian case in uh, the Netherlands through the EU institutions and through other member states. So not direct, this is a bit indirect, but sometimes it can yield uh, better results. Um, nevertheless, intense communication and, and demanding a very specific explanations or as Bulgaria is saying, some kind of tangible milestones or conditions, something that we can check the box and guarantees us that no veto will come again. Um, engage with the Swedish presidency, 
I would say. And here it's important also to maybe uh, apply pressure through the Swedish presidency, explaining why they changed, why they turned around, why, why, why the Swedish government turned around. Um, and then in the case of Bulgaria, I think it should be a little bit of a self-reflection as well, and that is to re-evaluate its own position when it comes to EU reforms. Because when you said, Sebastian, about veto and Bulgaria using um, using it um, and, and setting this as a guarantee to accept the start of negotiation for North Macedonia, we are in a very peculiar situation because we cannot just say, okay, let's let's abandon unanimity because our or the government's guarantees then are gone. So it's a very, very, very tricky situation. This means that all of our policies, Bulgarian policies, are really driven by by by, by this one this one uh, basis. Um, so maybe we should rethink a little bit and self-reflect as well. So maybe I have done quite a lot before, also at the diplomatic level. So what else have I, we done? Do you, yeah, do you, do you I, see I, anyone? I'm not optimistic and pessimistic either. I think it would happen during the Spanish presidency, second half of next year. Um, I, if I would have had the power, I would have congratulated the Czech presidency. And I'm sorry for what they did and for the fact that they put the Schengen subject forcefully on the menu of the political institution. They did absolutely outstanding. Um, I'm sorry that their intention to have something in the basket at the end of the presidency was torpedoed by, by other member countries. Austria is one of them. Um, uh, we'll see what will happen next. And this, re this reminds me of uh, of an anecdote. When I was Secretary of State and Andrei Plesh was Minister for Foreign Affairs, we were trying hardly to push that was in the 1997-98 to become a member of NATO. So was the case of Bulgaria at the time. You know, Madrid, uh, the, the, the meeting in Madrid, the summit in Madrid could not bring Romania and Bulgaria at that time into NATO. And um, Andrei Plesh uh, said at the time to Madeleine Albright, late Madeleine Albright, for Secretary of State, um, look, uh, call me when you're ready to take us in. We won't call you anymore. So I think this, this very moment can be well applied to the situation of today in the case of Romania, Bulgaria, and Schengen. So it's a, it's, a, it's a great concluding anecdote. Thank you for sharing it. Thank you to all of you for being here with us today and sharing your ex expertise. Many thanks to our audience for joining us today. Um, I would like to remind you that this discussion has been recorded and will remain available on our YouTube channel. So also please free to share it with uh, people that you know would be interested in this uh, subject. Um, if you would like to, if you like this discussion and you want to receive more information about our activities, then please subscribe to our newsletter, follow us on social media, visit our website. You will find all the links uh, in the description of this video all on our YouTube uh, channel. And also many thanks for your technical support to Gloria and Daniel Martinek, our colleagues. And so this is probably our last event, but never say never. <laughs> we don't have this one. Last this year. Yeah, we would like to wish you a very good end of this year. Merry Christmas if you celebrate it and see you next year. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.